Well, welcome back to Carmelly Conversations on Radio Maria, Christian Voice in your home. I'm your host, Mark Danis. Unfortunately, Frances Harry is not in studio with me this evening. Frances is actually traveling. She is going to celebrate the anniversary of a priest, a Father Bob Hughes, actually, who's celebrating his 60th anniversary this week, and we're so very uh, happy that she's able to join him. I'd ask you all, as we pray uh, this evening in our opening prayer, that uh, you would keep Francis uh, in her travels in your prayers, as well as Father Bob Hughes, a wonderful priest. I know him personally. I've known him for a number of years and has actually had a big impact on the Carmelite community here in Dayton, Ohio, where he served as our spiritual director in the early years as we formed our community. So we certainly want to lift Father Hughes up in our prayer this evening. A reminder that we're going to pick up on uh, the devotion to the Sacred Heart, this uh, particular broadcast, our uh, not conversation, but at least my uh, dialogue with you, the listener. And uh, specifically, we're going to focus on St. Teresa Margaret Reddy, or St. Teresa Margaret of the Sacred Heart, a Carmelite who had a great devotion to the Sacred Heart. And I'm going to begin our uh, conversation now with an opening prayer uh, dedicated, of course, uh, to the Sacred Heart. So if you would, please take a moment to get yourself recollected. Try to dispense with the cares of the day, our frustrations, anxieties, fears, any struggles we may be facing, and let's place those in the heart of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. O most holy heart of Jesus, fountain of every blessing, we adore you, we love you, and with a lively sorrow for our sins, we seek your healing. We offer you our poor hearts. Make us humble, Jesus, patient, pure, and wholly obedient to your will. Grant us, good Jesus, that we may live in you and for you. Protect us in the midst of danger. Comfort us in our afflictions. Give us health of body, assistance in our temporal needs, and your blessings on all that we do. Also the grace of a holy death. Within your heart we place our every care, our every need. Let them come to you and let us with humble trust say, within the heart of Jesus, Dear Jesus, help us. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, as I say today, we're going to pick up on the conversation that Francis and I had uh, just a week ago when we relaunched Carmelite Conversations on Radio Maria. We're very happy to be back. Um, we are still resolving some of the technical issues that we have yet to, uh, to iron out. Uh, where we will have a more formal studio setting. Uh, so I will again apologize if there are any um, uh, challenges to the uh, fidelity of, uh, of our sound and communication. Uh, I think that it worked reasonably well last week and we hope uh, that you're able to hear me clearly again this week. I do want to provide, as, a, as we always do, the references, the texts uh, that Francis and I will be drawing from for my own comments today as well as uh, our continued conversation which I su suspect will last for another couple weeks. This is a saint uh, whose uh, experience and life are very rich for us in Carmel and I think also for the church even though as I'll make a comment in a moment she's somewhat of an unknown saint uh, certainly to much of the Catholic Church and even in Carmel uh, but a wonderful saint for us to be focused on uh, during the month of June as we uh, devote our prayers and our sacrifices to the Sacred Heart. The first of those books is simply God is Love. It's by ICS Publications and the author is Margaret Rowe, her last name R-O-W-E. The subtitle is simply St. Teresa Margaret, Her Life. Again, the actual title, God is Love. The second title that we drew most of our material from um, is entitled, From the Sacred Heart to the Trinity, the Spiritual Itinerary of St. Teresa Margaret of the Sacred Heart. Again, an ICS publication, 
and the author is Father Gabriel of St. Mary Magdalene. Now we will host these uh, on our site, carmeliteconversations.com, so that you can access those if you weren't able to write that material down as quickly as I was speaking it. But they are two wonderful resources. I strongly encourage uh, listeners, if you are interested in learning more about uh, St. Um, Margaret of the Sacred Heart, uh, St. Teresa Margaret of the Sacred Heart, these are the best two texts available for investigating her life. I said a moment ago, St. Teresa, in so many ways, is the forgotten saint of Carmel. Um, it's interesting that many of her experiences, even though she was born in the mid-1700s, I'll give the biographical sketch in a moment, uh, but many of her experiences mirror those of St. Therese of Lisieux. Uh, her youth, uh, her coming into a deep, intimate experience of the Lord very quickly, uh, her passing at a very young age, only 22 years and five months of age, um, and also uh, the fact that her life was not uh, one filled with a, a whole series of mystical experiences. That's true of St. Therese of Lisieux. It was true of uh, St. Teresa Margaret as well, and maybe one of the reasons that we are attracted to her, uh, but certainly her life in many ways mirrors St. Therese of Lisieux. Her life is also a model of the writings of St. John of the Cross, which again, as I say, uh, might surprise us that we're not more familiar with her. She literally lived out the various phases that John describes to us in his two principal works, The Ascent of Mount Carmel and The Dark Night of the Soul, and her spiritual directors who were familiar with those texts. They would have been in print for over a hundred years by the time of St. Teresa Margaret's life. Uh, her spiritual directors could easily identify the phases of her spiritual maturity and development consistent with the writings of St. John of the Cross and identified it as such. She herself uh, was not familiar with John's writings. She was not um, broadly read uh, frankly, in many of the Carmelite saints, certainly Teresa of Avila, she knew very well, uh, but some of the other saints she did not. And John of the Cross, uh, even though he was quite well known in many Carmels, uh, was not familiar to St. Teresa Margaret Reddy. And I'm going to bring that up again because uh, I think it relates to part of why we uh, might find her appealing. The last point I make on this is, uh, and perhaps quite intentionally, it was her own desire to be a hidden saint. She wanted to be hidden among her sisters in the Carmel, literally. She didn't want to stand out. It was one of the things that she emphasized about her own experience. And so maybe it was that desire on her part to remain hidden that keeps her hidden from much of the church today. I, I would say that's perhaps unfortunate, uh, but nonetheless, um, it's Francis' and I desire uh, to expose her to the church and certainly to Carmel uh, and to you, our listeners, in giving uh, a, a deeper understanding of what we might take away uh, from her life. And that leads me actually to my next series of points. Uh, I have a few things I'd like to say up front about the reading of the lives of the saints. First, uh, I personally find it the most impactful spiritual experience for me to read the lives of the saints, whether I've read their writings or not. St. John of the Cross comes to mind here. I knew St. John uh, of the Cross's writings quite well for, for some time without fully understanding them. I certainly don't even claim to understand them fully today, uh, but only when I began to become familiar with the biographical material of his life that I began to get a deeper appreciation uh, of, of who John was and how what he had experienced was being uh, explained in his writings. Having said that, we should never read the lives of the saints with the attention of living their life. It is not as though we can sort of recreate the circumstances of a particular saint. And so we should never simply attempt to become that saint by copying their virtues, their attributes, and certainly not their sufferings. Now, those are determined by the Holy Spirit. Uh, but what we have to do is try to see how individual saints may have responded to the trials and the joys in their life and look for ways to apply that to our own individual and unique situations. The Lord does not expect us to be perfected in the same way as any other person. We're all different, of course, but he will deal with us in the specific situations and with the specific gifts he has given us. So we want to try and draw what fruit we can from the life of a saint 
And as I say, I, I think from my own experience, I get more benefit out of reading the lives of the saints, the individual experiences of the saints, and then using that to help guide me through their writings. I, I find that a, a particularly a fruitful uh, way of studying the saints. Next, I want to just caution uh, the, the listeners. When we are investigating the life of the saint, and by definition, someone who has demonstrated heroic virtue in their life, we need to have our own hearts sufficiently prepared to understand what it is the saint has to teach us, what their life has to teach us in addition to their writings. What I mean by this is that even before we begin to investigate the life of a particular saint, we should spend a great deal of time in prayer. I think that goes without saying for listeners of this program. That's well understood. We should first pray to the Holy Spirit to confirm that this particular saint is one the Spirit intends to use to teach us something about our own spiritual journey. Again, we don't want to try to mirror that saint's life in our own circumstances. We want to draw from their experience and apply it to our circumstances. And we should ask also that the Spirit be our guide as we come to know a particular saint, revealing to us what it is that we should be gaining from our deeper understanding of an individual saint's life, their experience, and their writing. Second, if we receive confirmation from the Holy Spirit, we should then ask the intercession of that particular saint, that we might draw again the greatest amount of fruit from our study of their life. What is it that they might uh, uh, impart to us? Might they intercede for us to help us better understand um, both their individual circumstances, how they responded to them, and how we can translate that learning into our own experience? The danger in our failure to do either of these two things is that we can run the risk of becoming discouraged if what we discover in the life of a particular saint is perhaps too demanding for us and appears to be a, a degree of discipline or sanctity we could not hope to aspire to. As I said a moment ago, this is a true of my experience with reading St. John of the Cross. I know when I first read him, I was somewhat um, put off by the demanding requirements that John outlines for holiness. But it was because I was not ready, and I frankly had too little appreciation for what it was that John was calling his readers to in the spiritual journey. It took a number of years in my own life of uh, difficult life experiences and coming to understand more about John's personal life before I could fully appreci appreciate and draw fruit from his writings. Now I said, uh, there are two dangers. The other danger, if we don't ask for the Holy Spirit's guidance or we don't ask the saint's intercession, is that we can fall victim to an inordinate zeal in our efforts to either duplicate the life of the saint, as I mentioned, or that we will take their writings to heart and believe we are prepared to implement all of them immediately. I didn't make that mistake with John of the Cross. Uh, as I say, I was more taken aback by his writings and the demands of it. But John wrote extensively about the development of the spiritual journey, and he provided numerous signposts along the way to help us understand what we should expect to experience at different stages of the spiritual journey so that we would not try to get of the Holy Spirit's work of sanctification in our life. And those signposts served as guides for me later when I returned to John not to expect certain things, not to try to create certain uh, circumstances in my spiritual journey, but to wait for the work of the Holy Spirit uh, to manifest them. Now, having set the stage for this investigation of the life of St. Teresa Margaret Reddy of the Sacred Heart, and I hope you will stay with us as we, as we continue that, certainly this is an invitation. I encourage you to continue the prayer to the Spirit as well as praying to St. Uh, Teresa Margaret uh, for her intercession. But let's look at some of the key aspects of her spiritual journey to see if you might find a connection with this wonderful saint. Um, and also, uh, looking at her personal experience, see if the Holy Spirit might not be working in your personal life in ways similar to uh, how he advanced um, St. Teresa Margaret Ray. First, it is important to know that although St. Teresa Margaret Reddy of the Sacred Heart, I'll continue to use her name as a saint, and once I transition into her biographical sketch, I'll warn you now that I'm going to use her, um, her, her um, pre-Carmelite name, her, her uh, Christian name. Um, but it's important to understand 
She was certainly an intelligent and, and a very perceptive woman, but she did not lean too heavily towards academic pursuits in her spirituality. I mentioned that. She completed the compulsory academic requirements up to her 17th year of education. And then when she entered Carmel, she isn't noted for um, having been particularly uh, studious, uh, reading large volumes of works, or for extensive writing. That's perhaps unfortunate for us. We do have her letters, uh, but she didn't write a lot of theological treaties or even reflections. We have her, um, her words that others heard and documented in her few letters, but they are sufficient, I think, to give us insight into her spirituality. Uh, as an example, she was not, I said this before, even familiar with St. John of the Cross's writings, even though she actually experienced each of the phases John so clearly describes in two of his most famous works, again, The Ascent and The Dark Night. Next, as it relates to St. Teresa Margaretti, though she did not have um, particularly powerful mystical experiences, she did have one uh, individual experience um, that was significant in terms of a sort of providing direction in her life. And like St. Teresa of Avila, whose writing she was familiar with, um, she certainly knew uh, enough about the spiritual journey, but it didn't come through a whole series of mystical experiences. I offer this because I think it may be encouraging uh, to those of us who may look at our own life and say either we don't want mystical experiences or we haven't had them, and can we still rise to the level of holiness or be raised to the degree of holiness and sanctity of a Saint Teresa Margaret Reddy? Well, I assure you, we can. It isn't based on mystical experience. I don't need to elaborate. Uh, we know this from the writings of Teresa and John. Uh, we don't need to have a series of mystical experiences to buy, either confirm us in our spiritual journey uh, or to lead us in it. And we'll see through the life of St. Teresa Margaret Reddy um, what it is that we, we are required to, to do to help ourselves, dispose ourselves, if you will, for the work that the Holy Spirit wants to do in us. Instead, as I mentioned, hers was a simpler experience of the Lord. She knew him and she understood what he seemed to want from her, but she was not supplied with a number of affirmations or mystical phenomena as some of our other saints were in Carmel. Next, St. Teresa Margaret Reddy of the Sacred Heart progressed extremely quickly in her spiritual journey. She enters Carmel at the young age of 17, and in only five short years, she's raised to the highest order of contemplation and love for and union with our Lord. This is a very brief period of time for any of you who understand the spiritual journey and the demands of it. You would recognize that that's a very fast pace uh, for anybody to advance. Finally, St. Teresa Margaret Reddy, the Sacred Heart's personal journey was one that was largely hidden from the world. I mentioned that earlier let alone those who lived within her convent in Florence. Her primary method of transformation was to remain hidden with the Lord, deep in her own interior, where she sought with uh, out respite to please and express her love to the one she knew loved her. So let me begin with this brief biographical sketch, uh, and then we'll go into some of the more specific details that I think reveal what allowed St. Teresa Margaret Reddy uh, to advance so quickly in her spiritual journey. She was born actually Anna Maria Reddy, and I'll be using that name now as I walk through the uh, period of her life before her entry into Carmel. She was born Anna Maria Reddy on July 15, 1747. Just briefly outlining some of the key events in her life, she was baptized that same year, received confirmation at age 10 and First Communion also at age 10. Her father was actually her spiritual director for about four years, from the age of 10 to the age of 14. Uh, thereafter, she was given to uh, a confessor, a priest at a boarding school she attended as her spiritual director, and then she had uh, subsequent spiritual directors when she entered uh, Carmel. In 1763, uh, at the age of now 16, uh, Anna Maria hears the words, I am Teresa of Jesus, and I want you among my daughters. Of course, this is Teresa of Avila. I'm going to explore that in greater detail in the second half of our program, but I want to point out, at a very early age, she did hear this voice. What's important is how she disposed herself, prepared herself to be able to hear that voice, and that's what we want to focus on. At the age of 17, she 
informs her parents, which we'll also explore, of her desire then to enter Carmel. The, uh, in 1767, at the age of 20, she receives a singular grace, Deus Caritas Est. She comes to understand the meaning of that Latin phrase, God is love, the title, in fact, of uh, Margaret Rowe's book that I mentioned earlier. And then, soon after this, her dark night begins, what I describe as uh, a very clear um, experience of what John described in The Dark Night, uh, John of the Cross's work, The Dark Night. Teresa Margaret Reddy, St. Teresa Margaret Reddy, experienced in, in great detail. And so we'll walk through that in later programs, but that began for her at age 20. She dies, as I said earlier, at the age of 22 years and five months. But by then, she had already been raised to a very high order of contemplation and mystical union uh, with our Lord. Now, just briefly, uh, regarding her childhood, by all accounts, she was a normal, healthy child. Her uh, early life didn't include any particularly remarkable elements of sanctity that might suggest her future holiness. But the one overriding question that seemed to mark her earliest experiences, and one that she was actually known to ask of many people, her mother and aunt, uh, priests, when she would come across and have the opportunity, she would ask them this simple question, who is God? Who is God? It's interesting that that was her question. Uh, this is interesting for ourselves, I think, and, and it's a question we should ask ourselves continually. In fact, it should be the material of our reflection and our meditation. As Margaret Rowe in the book uh, on St. Teresa Margaret Reddy pointed out, St. Thomas Aquinas himself, who entered, uh, was placed in a, a Benedictine abbey, Monte Cassino, in fact, the famous abbey, um, at age five, was known to wander about the halls asking the monks there over and over again the simple question, what is God? What is God? was St. Thomas Aquinas' question. Even St. Augustine, in his 10th book of the Confession, uh, his, his famous work, one of his famous works, requests this of the Lord. He said, let me know thee, O Lord, who knowest me. It seems to be a question and a reflection worthy of even our greatest saints and one that we should spend some time with. In addition, the only other unique aspect of her early years, aside from this continuing question, was her genuine desire for an apparent ability to enter into deep contemplative or at least recollection, prayer. Even as, an early, as early as age five, she had the desire and the capacity to lose herself in recollection. Recall uh, that recollection is our ability to recollect ourselves, enter into ourselves to find that quiet spot where the Lord may speak to us. And there's a quick story I want to just share before our break uh, regarding a brother of hers uh, finding her in this condition. Uh, Cicino was a, uh, a younger brother of our uh, saint, and he sat watching her one afternoon while he had been playing with some of the other children, uh, but she gave no indication of having even noticed him. He became aware of her air of deep absorption, which the simple knitting she was doing did not seem to account for. Cicino stayed watching for a long time, but Anna Maria did not move, and suddenly it dawned on the child that she was thinking of God praying, as he would say later, he realized, this was the first indication of the spirit of profound recollection, which was to develop in a girl until it became almost a habitual attitude. This is at a very young age, he already evidences this ability for deep recollection and appreciation and a desire to find herself in that situation that would allow her to enter into communion with our Lord. And it certainly marks the early stages of her childhood. When we return from our break, I'm going to pick up on the story of some of the additional uh, details of her early years, ages 10 and 12, and then we'll move on into um, the experience of her uh, notifying her parents of her entry into karma, what led to that, and also uh, an appreciation for what we can learn from this wonderful saint about how we too can dispose ourselves to the work of the Holy Spirit. A reminder, you're listening to Carmelite Conversations on Radio Maria, a Christian voice in your home. We'll be right back. Mark 
Welcome back uh, to Carmelite Conversations on Radio Maria Christian Voice in Your Home. We're going to pick up on our biographical material on St. Uh, Teresa Margaret Reddy of the Sacred Heart. Again, Anna Maria Reddy in her uh, pre-Carmel life. And I read from you the, the book by Margaret Rowe, God is Love, a brief sketch of the beginnings of uh, Teresa Margaret Reddy's, Anna Maria Reddy's ability to enter into recollection. It was something that she had acquired even at a very early age. We're talking now at about age 10 here in the story I just related, but even before that, she'd begun to uh, give signs of it. Uh, St. Teresa Margaret went on to uh, boarding school at St. Apollina's in Florence at the age of 12. It was actually during this period of her life and even before that her very devout father, Ignatius Reddy, began to serve as her spiritual director. Uh, this already deep and continuing affinity for her father would be one of the greatest challenges in later St. Teresa Margaret Reddy's life. Uh, she would face it when uh, later she would enter into Carmel and have to experience that separation from her father. But I don't want to get ahead of our story. Uh, she would spend the years of, ahead preparing herself to accept whatever the Lord might require of her. And that process began with her entry into St. Apollina's, the boarding school. Now, the transition from the busy life of a 12-year-old uh, on her father's estate to this almost convent-like routine of the boarding school was a difficult experience for many girls, but not for Anna Maria. Uh, in fact, I want to read again from Margaret Rowe just a brief account of this transition and how she went about uh, making it. Again, the busyness of her home life is now transferred to uh, the very quiet and subdued experience of the boarding school, much like the early stages of, of a convent life. And it is said Anna Maria seemed completely at ease. It was almost like a foretaste of the religious life. And she found nothing forbidding about it. In fact, as she had already developed quite a facility for prayer and recollection amid distracting and often trying circumstances, she found the peace and freedom with which she was permitted to indulge her taste for quiet meditation in this circumstance, a cause for delight. So we see even here uh, in this first early stage of transition, again, only a 12-year-old girl, as opposed to some of her counterparts who struggled with this transition, she just lost herself again in prayer and recollection. It was the means, the vehicle, if you will, uh, by which she was able to sustain herself and to make smooth transitions. We'll see this again in in the future events in her life, but it's important, I think, to note. Um, and again, I want to emphasize, that if we find ourselves uh, perhaps somewhat um, already um, uh, overwhelmed by the sanctity of this young girl, uh, I invite you to consider that the act of recollection, the process, the entry into this uh, quietude, this silence before our Lord, is something we're all invited to. It's something available to all of us. It's simply that... Uh, Anna Maria chose to actively engage this quite frequently throughout the course of the day. In fact, it is known that she could pray for a couple of hours, even at an early age, age 10, 11, and 12. The sisters who ran this boarding school, by the way, were keenly aware of Anna Maria's desire and this capacity for, for prayer. And so they wanted to test her a little bit, um, which is quite common, by the way, in religious life and, and not to be uh, dismissed, but rather a, a perfectly appropriate way uh, to help form saints. Uh, in order to do this, they put her in charge of the little children in the school, which would leave her little time for stealing away from personal prayer. This approach, in fact, had no negative impact on the young student. She never complained about it. Uh, she made up for her prayer time whenever possible. And apparently her great concentration and recollection seemed to stem from the simplicity of her prayer, which it is speculated did not consist of a great many intellectual reflections or the use of imagery, but rather a silent, simple, loving gaze on our Lord. That was the nature of her prayer. And that theme will run consistently throughout her life. Her prayer, her uh, approach to uh, the circumstances, changing circumstances on occasion of her life, were all uh, deeply embedded in the simplicity with which she approached life. Again, back to my comment about her not necessarily pursuing a particularly academic of spirituality, but one based largely in recollection 
and simple, silent, quiet prayer. There's another aspect of St. Teresa Margaret's early years that give us some additional insight into her rapid progress in the spiritual life. If you're sitting and wondering, how do I make that sort of progress so quickly? She's certainly a great saint for that. Uh, and it is, in this case, uh, how she conducted herself in reconciliation or the sacrament of penance uh, and also with her spiritual director. At the age of 14, Anna Maria's father, as I mentioned, had become her spiritual director, had continued as her spiritual director, but at 14 suggested it was time for her to begin to receive um, the benefit of a confessor. At St. Apollina's, a Don Peter Pellegrini uh, was the confessor. And it was during her discussions with this learned confessor that St. Teresa Margaret began to mature her own understanding of the assistance that was available to her through good spiritual directorship. With the help of Don Pellegrini, St. Teresa Margaret was able to become more comfortable with the process of revealing what she was experiencing in the depth of her soul, even at this relatively young age. And she left all of us a very solid teaching on how we too can participate in spiritual direction or in um, our um, use of the sacrament of confession with our confessors and how we can prepare ourselves to derive the most benefit out of the sacrament. I'm reading again from uh, Margaret Rowe's book here, but the writing, uh, the, the, the words are actually Teresa Margaret Reddy's. Knowing that he who listens and submits to your ministers listens and submits to you, my Jesus, I resolve to conquer that repugnance I sometimes experience in manifesting my soul and my heart to the one who represents you. And this in order to walk in all security towards perfection, promising to follow faithfully the teaching of the Holy Mother, St. Teresa, who said, To your confessor and your superior, you will tell all your temptations, imperfections, and repugnances, so that he may give you counsel and a remedy to overcome them. So right away, this relatively young girl is already um, mature enough to recognize the benefit that she could derive from sharing her personal experiences with her confessor, Don Pellegrino, uh, who also, as I said, served uh, sort of peripherally as her spiritual guide. Saint Teresa Margaret came to understand that there was no need for her to seek out multiple avenues for her spiritual growth. In fact, Don Pellegrino had discouraged her uh, from pursuing multiple um, avenues, one of those being uh, the reading of many books, diverse books. It was only necessary, according to him, to deepen her devotion to the simple approach the Holy Spirit was using to lead her. Again, reading from Margaret Rose's text, Anna Maria's progress had nothing to do with extraordinary states or mystical graces. It seemed preferable that she be left in ignorance that in her spiritual life, she was not just like all the rest, as much as she might have aspired to be, not like her companions as she considered herself. When a person, this is Don Pellegrino now, when a person once understands what has been said to him for his prophet, says St. John of the Cross, Don Pellegrino quoting St. John, he needs neither to hear nor say more, but rather to practice what has been said to him silently and carefully, in humility and charity and self-contempt, and not go away and seek new things, which serve only to satisfy the appetite in external matters and leave the spirit weak and empty and with no interior virtue. So right from the pages of St. John of the Cross, though she herself had not read them, Don Pellegrino is leading her down this path. And one of the things that St. John of the Cross, our great father, emphasizes is simplicity. He doesn't encourage us to go seeking our experiences or multiple uh, sources of, uh, uh, of spiritual wisdom and insight. Rather, he says, take what your confessor says, take the guidance of your spiritual director, remain in a state of recollection and focus on what you've been given, the fruit you've been given. That is what will lead you to sanctity. It is at St. Apollinas that, that at age 16, uh, our saint, our future saint, experiences, in fact, her first mystical encounter, and her only mystical encounter, for that matter, throughout her life. In her room one afternoon, she distinctly hears the words, I am Teresa of Jesus, and I want you among my daughters. Now, like so many of our great saints, St. Teresa Margaret's immediate reaction to this experience was to believe that it was not possible she'd heard anything. 
that it was only her imagination playing tricks on her. She was disturbed enough by it, in fact, uh, however, that she ran down to the chapel and knelt before the Blessed Sacrament. Suddenly, in a surge of emotion, which swept over her, she couldn't understand it, it wasn't something she'd dreamed up, she heard the voice again. It said, I am Teresa of Jesus, and I tell you that before long you shall be in my monastery. Now, this, as I say, was the only really significant mystical experience in the young life of St. Teresa Margaret, and not, for that matter, a particularly uh, compelling experience. It was an interior voice. It was not particularly spectacular. Now, before we respond to this with a sort of, aha, I told you, she had special privileges the rest of us don't have. I know it would be a normal reaction. But I'd hasten to remind us all that St. Teresa Margaret of the Sacred Heart's preparation for this experience was what we've already discussed. Recollection, uh, deep uh, understanding of how to use the benefit of a confessor and a spiritual director, revealing her heart constantly, desiring to be with our Lord. Recall, she was a woman of deep prayer. She learned how to reveal all of this to her, her confessor. And her singular motivation, her singular motivation in life, this is something, again, we should reflect on, was to love the Lord and become a saint. Now, how do we know this? Well, there was an incident during her years in Carmel, much later, obviously, in Carmel, when her spiritual director, who by then was a Carmelite priest by the name of Father Ildefonse of St. Aloysius, here in an exchange he had with the saint, we read Father Aloysius, Father um, uh, Ildefonse of Aloysius' own words, Scarcely was she able to understand that God is supreme Lord and creator than she felt drawn towards him with a deep and sincere love, which determined her to consecrate her every uh, action to him and have him before her mind constantly and in her heart and on her lips. Again, these are the, father, the words of Father of the Fonts. She desired not only to avoid offending him, but never to do anything even slightly displeasing to him. And uh, or not conformed, that would not be conformed to his glory and his will. All this herself she told me several times. And she added, so now these are the words of St. Teresa Margaret Reddy. Jesus knows well that from my infancy I have never longed for anything but to please him and to become a saint. Many years later, Father Ildefonse questioned her about this statement, specifically about this statement asking whether as soon as she took, was old enough to distinguish spiritual realities, she had turned to God with love of her heart. Astonished by the question, our saint responds this way, Why, of course, she said, just like everyone else. The point is that this particular aspect of her character demonstrates the unbelievable choice she made very early on her, in her life to love God. There was no sudden or dramatic decision. It didn't happen as a long process of dedication. It was simply the way her entire life was oriented. And again, we might feel a bit um, overwhelmed by this when we think that at such an early age she developed such an early level of, uh, I'm sorry, a great level of maturity, maturity, spiritual maturity. But we have to recognize that at any point in our life, we too can have this measure of devotion. This story certainly reveals St. Margaret's devotion to living her life and even at this early age. But our personal experience ought not to be one of being overwhelmed. The fact remains we are all able to discipline ourselves in exactly the same way. At any age, we can focus our attention on the Lord. If we doubt this for even a moment, we only need to look at the experience of St. Teresa of Avila, who wasted almost 20 years of her life by her own admission, not remaining focused on the Lord. However, when she rededicated herself, she wasted little time in getting herself back on track and committing herself as well to this life of recollection. And despite what would eventually become a very busy life, the life of St. Teresa of Avila, much of it lived in activities outside of the convent, she too was raised, as we know, to the seventh mansion, if we like that analogy, uh, to spiritual union, divine marriage, uh, uh, all of the the uh, experience of deep union with our Lord was something uh, true for St. Teresa of Avila. It was equally true for St. Teresa Margaret Reddy. But it was based not on, in Teresa Margaret Reddy's life, a series of mystical experiences, rather this simple devotion to recollection. 
The point we want to make here is that St. Teresa's deep devotion to prayer, her silence, her willingness to dispose herself to the direction of spiritual guides, and her desire to dedicate herself in, to the Lord, that was what predisposed her to receive the message from St. Teresa. If we ourselves feel as though we are not receiving similar communications from the Lord, from the saints or from angels, it might be that the Lord has chosen to guide us in a different way, but it might also be that we're not sufficiently disposed for receiving this form of communication. If we suspect that's possible, then we might want to prayerfully consider what we may need to do to leave ourselves available to hear the Lord's guidance. I don't mean in the form of a voice, the way St. Teresa Margaret Reddy may have, but in a way uh, that the Lord will choose to communicate to us. I know in my own life I can relate to uh, very personal experiences. One, when I was in the military and uh, had gone to a advanced schooling and was uh, desirous, quite frankly, of returning to that uh, particular institution as an instructor. And I did have a prayer life at this point, uh, early as it was in my, my spiritual journey. And at Mass one day, after Mass, I stayed to pray for a little while. And in the silence of that chapel with few people remaining after the Mass, I understood distinctly, in an interior way, the Lord communicating to me that I would, in fact, be returning to that particular uh, base and I would be assuming responsibilities as an instructor in the school I just graduated from. That, in fact, happened within a year. Um, and I, I didn't have necessarily, a, as I say, a very mature spiritual uh, understanding at that point, but I did have the affirmation. I shared as much with my wife, and within a year for a series of circumstances, we returned to that, that particular base. Uh, the other would be when I joined the Carmelites. Uh, I had gone on a, a search uh, for a secular community, any sort of um, community that might help me deepen my prayer uh, journey and my, my, my spiritual walk with the Lord. That was a motivation, certainly. Uh, but it was only after a fair amount of reading and investigation of a number of different options for secular orders that I was at a friend's house one night and he called me over and asked me, uh, the uh, nature of a statue he had just received. I knew instantly that it was Our Lady of Mount Carmel. I saw the scapula, I saw her holding uh, Our Lord, and I knew instantly the color scheme of, of her attire, of course, uh, demonstrated it, uh, that it was Our Lady of Mount Carmel. And again, that interior voice spoke to me. I didn't hear anything, but it was as affirming as anything I might have heard had somebody spoken it that told me I was going to enter Carmel. I knew it. And, and from that moment on, I began a search and uh, not long after, in fact, I think within a matter of months, uh, I began my journey in Carmel. So I want to reiterate this principle about understanding our Lord's will for our lives. In fact, I want to do so by reading a quote from uh, the words again of St. Teresa Margaret Reddy that I think emphasize this very well. All things reveal God to the soul who understands how to find him in created nature. Now from the imitation, the book, The Imitation of Christ. If in all things you seek God... Doubtless you will find God. Anna Maria had perfected this art by now, this stage of her life, and possessed a special facility for raising her heart and her mind to the Creator by creating the beauty that He had scattered around her. So it wasn't that she was uniquely prepared. It wasn't that she was special. It wasn't that she had something none of us have. She simply had prepared her heart for receiving what it was that the Lord wanted to communicate, and He happened to use uh, our own uh, St. Teresa of Avila for that message. St. Teresa Margaret would complete her formal schooling at St. Ampelidas at age 17. I said that before. And it was expected she would simply return there uh, and enter the Order of the Benedictines, who uh, were the uh, order that oversaw that particular uh, school. And as was customary, especially for Anna Maria, um, when she returned home, she had many responsibilities around the house and in helping her father, her mother was bedridden at that time and quite ill. Uh, her father and her would spend a great deal of time in his office discussing the various details and tasks uh, associated with the upkeep of the house and uh, maintaining the, the uh, education of the younger children. Um, and, and in these uh, hours that they spent together, you can well imagine uh, that um, Anna Maria would love to have shared with her father 
what it was uh, that she intended to do with her life, meaning intercarmel, but he had already instructed her that he did not want her making any decisions about her future until she reached uh, her 17th year. That would be in July, in fact, July 15th of the very year after she graduated uh, St. Apollinas. Uh, truthfully, the memory of her experience of the voice of Teresa of Avila and her desire to enter Carmel were the only thoughts that occupied her at this time. But she didn't say anything about it. And it brings up another aspect of her um, a character and an attribute, uh, something we in Carmel talk about extensively, and that is silence. Silence is not just what we always refer to as interior sounds. But here in the case of uh, St. Teresa Margaret Reddy, of the Sacred Heart. It is silence about the details of her life. She'd been given direction by her father. There will be no decision about your future until you reach your 17th year. And she abided by that. So we see both the obedience to her father, she had great respect for, and also silence of what she knew was her future. She'd been affirmed in this. She had been um, quite convinced now uh, through continued prayer that St. Teresa of Avila had called her and she was quite um, excited about the prospect of eventually joining Carmel. It was at this time, uh, again, somewhat consistent with the experience of many saints, uh, that Saint uh, Anna Maria's begin, uh, or, I'm sorry, um, Anna Maria's testing for entering Carmel began. She maintained her silence, I said that before, about her decision to enter Carmel, with the exception of a hometown priest, a Father Gioni. She had shared with him only the fact of the experience she'd had with Teresa of Avila, but not affirming her intent to actually enter Carmel. When he heard this news from Anna Maria, Father Gioni, again a, a, a priest from her hometown, immediately agreed that she should abide by her father's wishes, not communicate any of this. Again, he didn't know that it was in her, in her intention to enter, but not communicate any of this. And when the time <clears throat> passed, it was actually Father Gioni who actually shared the news with a fellow Jesuit and, and someone who was the brother of Anna Maria's father, and that man was um, um, Rodrigo Reddy, uh, I'm sorry, Diego Reddy, Diego Reddy. He himself was a, a Jesuit priest. He is the one who actually communicated it to his brother, Anna Maria's father, uh, that her daughter desired to enter Carmel. Now this brings us sort of to, to the head of of uh, this issue with her father and what she's going to have to struggle with ultimately in separating from her father. When father and daughter finally had reached the opportunity uh, to discuss the matter, Ignatius, her father, broke down in tears at the realization that his, his daughter, his beloved daughter, was in fact going to commit herself to Carmel. I can read just briefly, uh, Anna Maria, uh, had to cling to every reserve of grace and willpower she could muster in order to prevent herself from running to and hugging her father, flinging in his arms. He, who put his hand to the plow, she understood, looks back and, and looks back, is unworthy of me. He who loves father and mother more than me is not worthy to be my disciple. These words rang in her ear. She uh, faced many other struggles before her entry into Carmel. I don't want to go through all of them. They're interesting, but perhaps not pertinent, though for those of us who um, have had the call of the Lord to a deeper walk, a, a, a more advanced um, intimacy with the Lord, we know what it's like to face these trials and these struggles. They're inevitable in this process. Um, but it's sufficient, I think, to understand how God works uh, that to our purpose. Anna Maria in her turn, realized she could profit by accepting what inevitably were a series of delays that seemed far too long for her desire. After all, she only sought admission to Carmel in order to please and serve her God. Now, in an exchange with a Mother Mary Magdalene at the Florence Carmel, um, she reveals a little bit about this anticipation, this excitement she has about joining Carmel. We'll sort of end our um, a dialogue here today on this topic because it leads to uh, a deeper understanding of uh, Anna Maria, St. Um, Teresa Margaret's preparation for entry into Carmel. Mother Mary Magdalene, prioress of the Carmel, replied that Anna Maria had been accepted and the girl wrote once more asking this time for a rule of life. 
In response to the request, the prior suggested that for one intending to enter Carmel, she could think of no better practice than to accustom herself to mortify her own will in all things, however trifling, and to yield willingly her own rights in order to convenience others, pleasantly agreeing with their opinions, treating all with genuine kindness, and thus making a continual, entire sacrifice of herself to God. This is what Mother Mary Magdalene wrote back to Anna Maria. Anna Maria had good will, and she carefully followed these counsels. Now, Anna Maria had, by now, uh, the authoritative source, the secret of the essential spirit of Carmel, the holocaust of one's will. Rather than the rigid adherence to exterior acts of mortification, this transformation of self needed no set method or framework. The Carmelite life is comprised of an ideal setting for a life of spiritual childhood. Because of its utter simplicity, somewhat humdrum and seemingly sometimes trivial routine, nevertheless, it ensured complete interior liberty. More painful, however, than these delays that I just referred to were the final hours before her actual entry into Carmel. That's when she had to separate from her father. And just this last bit I want to read to you, uh, the signs that were posted as her father had to depart um, his, his beloved daughter and leave her behind the grill in the Carmel. He reads, Remember that you have only one soul, that you have only one death to die, that you have only one life which is short and has to be lived by you alone, that there is only one glory which is eternal. If you do this, there will be many things about which you care nothing. Those are the words, some of you may recognize, of Teresa of Jesus, Teresa of Avila. And right beside them was another plaque that both Ignatius, her father, and Anna Maria would read as she entered the Carmel. Since when an hour of reckoning comes, it will grieve thee that thou hast not employed this time in the service of God. Wherefore dost thou not order and employ it now, as thou wouldst wish to have done, wert thou dying? Those are the words of St. John of the Cross. The great Carmelite saint, St. Teresa of the Zoo, certainly shared John's confidence in God, not because of her own efforts in loving Jesus, but because she was certain that Jesus loved her. In 1895, she wrote a poem that's going to serve as our a closing prayer today, and it is a prayer to the Sacred Heart. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. A heart I need to soothe me and to bless, a strong support that cannot pass away, to love me wholly, even my feebleness, and never leave me through the night or day. There is not one created thing below that can love me truly and can never die. God became man, none else my needs can know. He, he alone can understand my cry. Well, thank you for joining me today, listeners. A reminder, you've been listening to Carmelite Conversations on Radio Maria.